Sì, Antoine Browis from uh, Instituto Optique in uh, Paris. Thank you very much. All right, good afternoon everyone. Uh, first, of course, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Very happy to be here. Actually, it's my first time in Brazil, maybe at a bit difficult time for the country, who knows, but okay, <laughs> at least it's nice for me to visit and see many faces that I've met already. Okay, so uh, I have three lectures of one hour, and so basically what I will try to do in a very selfish way is to cover uh, many body physics with arrays of individual atoms, so mainly what we do in our group. But I will spend hopefully 40 minutes today to show you a bit more generally uh, what you can do with Wittberg atoms. So that's what I'm going to start with. So uh, the Institute Optique is actually, uh, despite the fact there is an Eiffel Tower here, we are not in Paris. Uh, we are actually south of Paris, 20 kilometers south, on a campus called Université d'Orsay, maybe some of you know. Uh, actually, it's called uh, Paris Saclay. Now it has changed name recently. And uh, indeed, that's where we do uh, our experiments. OK. so. Uh, the goal that we have in mind, and that's shared by many, 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 many groups around the world, including uh, the previous uh, the Iron Trapper of this morning, who will talk just after me, but is to make some kind of, to build in the lamp some kind of artificial uh, quantum matter. Okay, so you take atoms one by one, or ions, or whatever, and you try to create an artificial matter. So why would you do that? So the reason why you would do this is, uh, actually there are several reasons, but um, let me just flash a few of them. Uh, so let's start very generally. So the first thing is because uh, you want to study many-body physics. And uh, if you take the ground state of any uh, many-body system, usually it's an entangled state. So it's immediately interesting, right? I will come back to that uh, in uh, the, I mean the rest of the lecture, so I'm not going giving too many uh, details at the moment. Another uh, uh, place where it's very important to do this kind of quantum state engineering is uh, the emerging field of quantum um, Metrology. So what is quantum metrology? This is this idea that if you take an ensemble of particles and instead of them from each other, you just have them correlated in a quantum way, then you may enhance the precision of a measurement. So for example, you just take an ensemble of two-level atoms, cesium atoms, for example, that define the second, and you know that if you take n of them, basically the uh, ultimate uncertainty you can have on your clock is, uh, goes like the square root, the inverse of the square root of the number of particles. But that's assuming that there are no correlations between the particles, and you can beat that. You can engineer some particular states for which you can go from this 1 over root n scaling to the 1 over n scaling, and there are even other type of scalings. But the basic idea is that by engineering the way you want an artificial quantum matter, you can engineer some particular quantum state, and in this way you can enhance the ultimate resolution of a clock. There is a fourth uh, region where, first, uh, fourth domain where it's interesting, and we'll hear more, I guess, uh, this afternoon. This is all what is related to quantum information. So, you quantum information basically has two fields quantum communication and quantum uh, communi uh, uh, computing. So, in quantum communication, you try to make use of properly engineered quantum state in order to uh, transmit uh, information in a more secure way. And in quantum computation, you try to use the resources of quantum mechanics, so superposition, entanglement, in order to speed up or to change the class of complexity of a system. So if you want to factorize a number, typically using classical argument, uh, algorithm, it should be an exponentially difficult uh, task. And just by changing the machine, so not resorting on a classical machine, but a quantum machine, you change that from exponential to polynomial. Doesn't mean that the power here uh, it can be very large, but it doesn't matter. It's a change uh, in the scaling. And finally, there is a very uh, maybe the kind of reason we all have in mind when we do physics, whether experimental or not. And I don't know what to ask as kind of question, but the basic idea is that I mean we know that all world kind of look classical, while at the macroscopic level it's certainly quantum. So how do you go from one to another? And there are some kind of answers, but not all of them. And so people propose that there is actually a transition between a classical world and a quantum world. So basically, one idea would be, well, let's try to engineer a system where we grow the number of particles, and each of them are very well controlled at a quantum level, and we see whether at some point, when the system becomes large enough, I mean, this kind of superposition or entangled state kind of collapses or not for fundamental reasons that we don't know. And there is, for the moment, for example, the superposition principle, we have no idea to which scale it is valid. Right? So we don't know whether it's valid at a macroscopic scale. It has only been tested with very small objects so far. Okay. So, um, 
of course, if you want to do that, if you want to engineer states, uh, quantum states, you need platforms. So everything I'm going to say in the last, uh, in the next three lectures, is from an experimentalist. So it will be a many body physics for the dummies, in a sense, <laughs> and very down to earth for many details I will get. So basically, we need now not like a virtual two-level system. We need a platform into which we can encode that. And there are plenty around, okay? So there are all the ones that the AMO physicists know how to handle, and I've been uh, I've learning to handle over the years. Neutral atoms, which I'm going to talk about, but just a subset of this. Trapped ions, I mean, we you have like uh, three lectures on this. Photons are actually also a very important uh, system that you can uh, engineer using the polarization or the modes, degrees of freedom. But that's not all. I mean, in the recent years, there were also some new uh, type of atoms called artificial atoms that were developed. So, for example, you can think of kind of an artificial hydrogen atom. So this is in a diamond uh, crystal. You can remove one, at one carbon atom. It's a vacancy. You can replace another one by a carbon atom. And then you've got the equivalent of uh, nitrogen vacancy, which is exactly like a nitrogen atom. So it's an artificial atom. You also have an electron, which you can trap in quantum dots. So that's one particular example of this. So in this way, this system like looks like a box potential with discrete energy levels. And finally, of course, you've got this uh, very promising full, uh, field of uh, superconducting qubits, where you try to encode the information for example, on a, on a small current loop where the current can either circulate left or right in this uh, loop. Okay, so what uh, they all share, despite the fact that the, the details are very different, but they all share the fact that they can be described to a certain extent in a given level of approximation, of course, as an ensemble of two-level systems. So a two-level system, you can also map it onto a spin system, and so that's the reason why you can study many-body physics, uh, some kind of many-body physics. So among all these systems, the one that we're going to uh, discuss for the, all these lectures is uh, our arrays of Rydberg atoms. So I will try to explain you uh, what are the Rydberg atoms, so what are the arrays and all this. Okay, so that's the program, is to look at a very, very small subset of uh, these platforms, uh, try to see what we can do and how far we can go with them. Uh, the same, of course, advice as for all the other lecturers. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, hopefully the talk is very, very, I mean, not too complicated, so please do not hesitate to ask questions. All right. So, uh, these are the outlines. So, it's basically the three lectures. So, today I will try to introduce you to Rydberg atoms, what they are, and uh, the platform we have at the Institute of TIT that we've developed over the years, which, are these, uh, which is this array of uh, single atoms uh, that you can control. And so now lecture two and three will not be equally split between, uh, actually, lecture two and three. <laughs> uh, I will spend uh, like about 40 minutes describing the interaction between Rydberg atoms tomorrow. And then I will uh, spend the second half and the third lecture uh, to describe uh, elementary quantum simulation and the many body physics that we've done with this kind of platform. Okay. So let's start with uh, the first part, which is uh, the, the platform and what is a Rydberg atom. So for today, this is what I would like to discuss. First, uh, a small introduction to Rydberg physics, and then uh, show you some plumbing, basically, how you trap individual atoms in tweezers, a bit what uh, Philip did this morning for the ions. I'm going to do it uh, for uh, atoms, so there are some things that are a bit specific to the fact that we want to have one and only one atom at the end. I will show you that then we can arrange these individual atoms trapped in a platform, in a tweezer, into given arrays. And then uh, I will give you some kind of plumbing, which are kind of necessary to understand the remaining part of the talks, like how you excite them to Rydberg state, how you read out, and so on. Okay, so let's start with uh, the introduction to Rydberg physics. So I put here a few uh, references uh, that I found kind of nice. They are more or less uh, complicated. I mean, the first book being kind of the Bible in the domain, but it's also a bit heavy to read. Uh, there are now very nice uh, reviews uh, that uh, you can look at and that have emerged over the last few years. All right, so let's start uh, kind of easy. Let's uh, start Rydberg physics by a few historical landmarks. So historically, uh, they kind of those landmarks date to as far as the beginning of the 19th century. Actually, there was this guy, uh, Joseph Fraunhofer, which we know very well for the diffraction, for example, uh, theory, uh, observed in the spectrum of the sun some dark lines. So this is supposed to be what he has observed, so that's... Uh, a stamp from the Deutsche Post, I guess, uh, to celebrate the whatever, it is whatever, some birthday associated to that. Okay, but it was uh, not until 1888 then, uh, that Rydberg uh, put up his famous formula, which is uh, the fact that the 
wavelength or the difference in wavelength between all these lines could be described like the difference in two, uh, the inverse of the square of principal quantum number. So the exact formula written in his own n is this one, so it's a bit more complicated <laughs> to read than now, we're not less used to that. But that's really the idea that you have an infinite series. And as soon as you have an infinite series, you can take n, if you keep m constant, n goes to infinity, so you can approach more and more the continuum, and this is exactly where the other states are. Okay. So the thing I'm uh, going to focus on for all the lectures, but uh, not at all fundamental, but just for the sake of simplicity, is uh, the first column of the periodic table. The reason why I do that is because essentially they look like hydrogen atom, in a way that I'm going to, sh to tell you in a minute, which is to say that there is one external electron and a core, which is uh, I mean, essentially a plus charge. Of course, now people have handled many other types of Rydberg atoms, and you can find them in any, uh, in any atoms, the Rydberg state. But just to make it easy, let's stick to that. Okay, so alkali, typically, one electron in the S shell, so L equals zero. Okay, so this is the case of uh, rubidium, okay, which is the one we use uh, in our group. People have also used cesium and uh, sodium recently. So this is the, what is called the Gautrian diagram of this. Those are just all the energy level, I mean, some of them at least, uh, sorted in values of the angular principle, uh, the angular number, so L, and the principal quantum number, N. So starting from the ground state to all those states. There is no clear-cut definition about what is a Rydberg atom. Actually, a Rydberg atom is not an atom you find in the periodic table. It's just an atom that has been highly excited. Now, of course, you need to define what is highly excited, and I don't know. It's when is N is larger than 1, so which doesn't mean much because 5 is already larger than 1. But okay, let's say that it's about N is around... Uh, above 10. So then all those states have the property that they kind of pile up around the ionization threshold. So the Rydberg state for us are going to be this highly excited state. And typically, we're going to operate with n equal 50. Those are going to be our target states uh, between 50 and 100. OK, so all these, and this comes from experiments, can be uh, summarized in this very simple formula. So this simple formula tells us that the energy of each of these levels as a function of the principal quantum number is actually minus the Rydberg constant. So the Rydberg constant is the one that we all know from our class on hydrogen atoms. So typically, this is 13.6 eV. There are many digits, actually. It's the best known uh, fundamental constant of measured value, sorry. Uh, but in any case, this is uh, a formula which is essentially the one of the hydrogen atom, but for the fact that there is a small correction here, which is that instead of having minus 13, 6 over n square, we can, which would be the case for the hydrogen, we change that slightly uh, by introducing this, what is called a quantum defect here. So that's just an experimental fact, right? This is not something which is fundamental. And that comes from this idea that uh, an uh, a Rydberg atom is essentially an hydrogen atom, but not quite. So if I just take this picture that there is a core, which I will uh, say is charged with a plus charge, because there is z minus one electron in it and z plus charge, then I have another electron E here. Right? So it's almost equivalent to saying that I have a plus and a minus uh, charge, like an hydrogen atom. The thing which is a bit different here that, of course, you've got the size of the ion core. So for low enough angular momentum, so for example, L equals zero, you know that actually the classical trajectory would just be a straight line for the electron. So it means that the electron has a non-zero probability to enter in the core, and that reduces the energy. Okay? Because instead of seeing a plus charge, it sees a charge which is screened by, uh, I mean, which is no longer screened, sorry, by the other uh, uh, minus charges. And this is why you can summarize that in the by hardly changing the hydrogen atom. Just taking into account the fact that for low angular momentum, this quantity describes the fact that the electron enters the, electronic co the ionic core. OK, so I'm too far for this thing to. <laughs> OK, so uh, you can find some. So this is just for rubidium. Those quantum defects have been measured. There is no way to calculate them. Right? You need to measure and to fit the theory with those uh, measured values. They are known to a very well uh, uh, accuracy. To say they are more digit, actually. But roughly speaking, you see that at low angular momentum, the corrections are the largest. And as soon as you are around L equals 3, the electron kind of avoids the uh, electronic core. 
and therefore you can assume that uh, this uh, delta is almost zero. But it means that for the low-lying state we're going to work with, uh, this is important to keep in mind that this is not the principal quantum number, but it's slightly uh, changed. Okay, so the classical picture is the one I described you. So this is basically the electron core and the fact that the electron spirals very far from the nucleus. And the scaling law, which is very important, is the fact that the size, which is to say the average value of the radial coordinate, which you could calculate by calculating the wave function, so I'm not going to do it, but you just take the usual uh, matrix element and r theta phi, r d3 r, is actually scaling like the square of the uh, Bohr radius. Okay, So this is already telling you that Rydberg atoms are huge. And they are really, really huge. I mean, for n already around 60, you are almost on the size of a biological object. So it means that the electron spirals at a size which is larger than the bacteriophage that we have here. And I got uh, around 100, you are as large as this kind of typical bacteria. So it's really in the macroscopic uh, regime almost, uh, those Rydberg atoms. Those are huge objects. Also, of course, they are huge but very, very fragile because the electron is very far from, uh, the, from the, the nucleus which bind it. Okay, so the consequence of these uh, are actually two folds for what uh, matters to us. The first one is that they have a long lifetime. So the kind of lifetime I'm talking about here is the fact that when you are in a Rydberg state or of course, you've got many different Rydberg states there, but mainly you can decay down to the ground state. And this radiative, sc uh, radiative decay scales like the cube of the principal quantum number. So the rate to do that is proportional to 1 over n cubed. So once again, it means you need to calculate the overlaps of the wave function here with the overlap of the wave function having very many wiggles in the Rydberg manifold. And it leads to this kind of scaling, 1 over n cubed, which I'm not going to do. But so the consequence of that is that if you take n larger than 60, typically, the lifetime of a Rydberg atom starts to be long. Actually, not super long. It's only about 100 microseconds. But it's long enough to be able to do experiments. And I'll come back to this when we start the many-body physics, because that's a very important remark. So that's the first uh, pretty important thing. So basically, you can work in the metastable state and completely ignore the low-lying state as long as you do experiment for less than 10 microseconds. Uh, the second uh, very important consequence uh, of this large size of the atom is the fact that if you calculate the dipole uh, matrix element between two nearby states of opposite parity, so typically this state, L, with another one, N prime, nearby, L plus or minus one, you of course recover these very large scalings. So it's just reminiscent of the fact that the average of the radial uh, coordinate is N squared, so which tells you the size. So here again, well, the dipoles sca scale again like the square of, uh, the, of the principal quantum number. Okay, and so, of course, it has two consequences. The things is that it's a regular atom with exaggerate properties. And the two exaggerate properties are very strong interaction, which is what we're going to use, and I'm going to describe you tomorrow uh, how they interact and how strong they can be. But also, very important, they can uh, strongly couple to external fields. So you can act on them with an AC electric field, or so microwave field typically, or DC uh, field. Okay, so you've got some knobs that with even a very small amount of field, you can tune uh, widely the parameters of the, of the atoms. Okay? Right, so uh, just to summarize, I'm not going to go through all of them, but basically, Rydberg atoms have exaggerated properties, and some of them are uh, uh, summarized in here. So once again, the size of the wave functions, the lifetime, like the cube, the polarizability, which is very important when it uh, comes to acting with a static electric field, scale like the seventh power, and the van der Waals coefficient, we're going to derive that tomorrow, scale like the 11th power of the principal quantum number. So you see that is a very wild scaling that you have here. Okay, so let's go back to history now and uh, try to see what uh, people have done uh, with this. So we were stuck at Rydberg so far, so Rydberg discovered uh, this formula that uh, derives or describes the different transition in an atom. And so people, as soon as the lasers were invented, started to do spectroscopy of this Rydberg state. And there are many very famous names, uh, Tom Gallagher, uh, Kleppner, uh, Serge Arroche, and many, many other people 
We started to do that as uh, basically a few years, like about five, six years after the lasers were invented. And uh, kind of importantly, between 1980 and 2000, there was a field that made use of this very strong interaction between an atom and an external field. This is the field of a quantum, a cavity quantum electrodynamics. So this field uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize, like in 2012, to Serge Arroche. There was also another key player at the Max Planck, uh, uh, Walter, who died before uh, Arroche received the prize, unfortunately. And the basic idea is what? The basic idea is that you want to have a cavity able to store a photon, and that you want that by the time the atom stays in the cavity, you can interact doing enough Rabi cycles between the atom and the field before the atom decays. So the decay is kind of structured by basically the quality of the mirror you can get. So the thing that was very important is to have a D dot E, so the dipole times the strength of the electric field, which is as large as possible, and in particular, much larger than the decay, the leaking through the cavity. Okay? And you see that, basically, that's where the scaling in n square proved very useful, because in this way, you can have, within a decay of the cavity, many Rabi cycles, while before, because d was too small, it was not possible to, to see that, you were just in this over-dense regime where you could only see the exponential decay. So this realization was the beginning of this field of uh, quantum uh, electrodynamics. And basically, that led to all the experiments where one Rydberg atoms interact with one photon. Yep. Sorry? Uh, I'm plotting, for example, yes, the population that the atom is in the excited state when it starts in the excited So actually, this part is wrong, of course. It has to uh, decay down to the ground state, if this is the point you were trying to make. <laughs> All right. So, so far, there is nothing about the interactions between the atoms. And so, the idea that you could use, in a cunning way, the interactions uh, dated from uh, almost 2000, so end of the 90s, with two pioneers, so Pierre Pillet in actually Orsay, and uh, Tom Gallagher in uh, Charlotte in the US. And this is this idea that if, and we're going to dis discuss that a bit more tomorrow, but the basic idea is that if you put one, two excitations, for example, one atom in a P state, another one in a P state, so two Rydberg state, you could have a diffusion of those two excitations through the cloud, which is mediated by the resonant dipole-dipole interaction, which I will uh, explain to you tomorrow. But the basic idea is that you have this kind of two states, P and P, that are almost degenerate with this one. So basically, these two diffusions can move away from the center of uh, so where they've been created. But very importantly, they can move away faster than the atoms can move, because the interaction is very strong. So basically, the diffusion of the excitation was faster than the motion, and that induces correlations between all the atoms in the cloud. And so uh, this is uh, what people call the frozen gas. So basically, the motion doesn't become important, and you are completely dominated by the interactions. And for that, well, you need typical uh, temperature, which are less than a millikelvin, the typical uh, interaction strength. And this is possible because laser cooling was invented at the time. Well, before it was not. OK, so now. Uh, people starting to look a bit more in detail uh, to uh, these interactions between Rydberg. And this is a review that came out around 2010 that kind of summarized the various type of interaction that an, at an atom can go uh, to with a, a second atom. And we're going to uh, look more at the details of the numbers tomorrow. But basically, if the atoms are in the ground state, they are in the Van der Waals regime. Forget about the fact that they can have magnetic moment. We just ignore that. But basically, the Rydberg interaction is almost as strong when atoms are separated by one micron as the ion separated by the same distance. Okay? There are some uh, details uh, that we will discuss, but the basic idea is that uh, you've got an almost 11 order of magnitude increase in the strength of the interaction just by going to the Rydberg, and this is what we're going to use. Okay, so then there were two papers, very important in the history of uh, this uh, renewed field of Rydberg physics. Uh, with names that many of you probably know. So there is uh, the famous Peter Zoller and uh, Michel Lukin, always them. And uh, the second paper is Michel Lukin and Peter Zoller, but always them as well. And at the end of the day, that kind of started this idea that you could use those very strong interactions, if you control uh, everything well enough, to do some quantum uh, type of uh, manipulation, so namely what is called the Rydberg blockade. So the idea is the following. So the idea is that you just take a pair of atoms, uh, ground state G, excited state R, and you just plot here the spectrum of this ensemble of atoms. So essentially, if the two atoms are in the ground state, 
well, they have almost an energy which is independent of the distance because the interaction is super weak. The same thing if you've promoted one and not the other. And only if you have prepared the two of them in the Rydberg state do you have a significant interaction as a function of distance, uh, so which shows up here in the Van der Waals regime as an energy shift. And so the consequence of that is that if you just drive a laser which is on resonance with the excitation on one atom, then it, you cannot access the second atom provided the fact that the line width of the excitation is smaller than the strength of the interaction energy. So this is called the Rydberg blockade. And it has a very important consequence is that if the atoms are close enough, you just shine your laser and your laser do not distinguish between uh, the two atoms. So basically, you've prepared the superposition of having excited the first one or the second one. So just this realization was the whole idea that you could use the blockade to generate entanglement, which is something which is highly non-trivial to do. Uh, I think some people would not deny that <laughs> in this room. OK, so this is uh, the idea that you can do entanglement and gates using that. So, of course, people then immediately started to look for this blockade regime. And before, uh, I mean, they, they started to do that in random ensemble because that was the only thing that was available at the time. So there are a few experiments we are not going to discuss, but basically around 2004 and 2006, people starting to see whether indeed this blockade couldn't lead to a saturation of the number of Rydberg you put in the system. Okay, that's because you can only fit a certain number of atoms within a Rydberg cloud, so it should lead to a maximum number of Rydberg that you put in. So there were many groups that looked for that, starting from cold atomic cloud to uh, BECs. And so the two uh, first experiments that showed that indeed you can do some uh, thing with individual atoms were done by uh, our group at the Institute Optique and the group of Mark Safman, where basically we showed that indeed we could prepare this uh, kind of uh, entangled state using the blockade. I mean, of course, as you may have guessed, this is an experimental curve, and the theory should be a curve oscillating between 0 and 1. I'm not describing that for the moment. You'll see tomorrow. So it's far from being ideal, but that was the first step uh, towards the direction of uh, using the Rydberg to do something uh, quantum, the, the, the Rydberg blockade. So where are we now? So in uh, 2018, this field has actually moved towards mainly four directions, and it's always hard to categorize them, but the basic idea is quantum information processing, which is to say building gates and trying to create entanglements in the system. Of course, uh, and there are some names which I'm not citing, so Mark Safman, uh, Biederman, there are many other groups that are joining now. Uh, the field of quantum simulation and many-body physics, which we are in, uh, and which of course is not completely unrelated to the previous one, but still the idea here is just more to explore many-body physics system. And then there are some other directions where you could use this Rydberg blockade in order to create to use this blockade, which is at the atomic level, to see what consequence it has on the scattering of light by this ensemble of atoms, which is to say you could create by the blockade the equivalent of a single photon source, or you could even make two photons interact in a medium just by mediating the interactions between the two atoms uh, by the Rydberg interaction. So basically, you have a photon-photon interaction mediated by an atom-atom interaction. This is the whole field, which I'm not going to describe, which is very interesting. And there is also a, a last direction which has actually emerged from uh, Tillman Pfau, uh, which is to create some kind of exotic type of molecules. I mean, people has re have realized uh, that by having an atom in the Rydberg state and all the other, and uh, the second one in the ground state, you access a new kind of molecule. So it's not a molecularly bound molecule, that's a new kind of binding mechanism, which was introduced by Fermi in the 30s and never uh, observed until. Uh, Tinman and Robert did the experiment uh, in 2009. So those are kind of the wide categories that I could see uh, today, uh, like uh, the, the, the direction that people are working in. Any questions so far? Everyone is having a nap, right? <laughs> OK, so, uh, so that's basically all for the overview of the field. And now I'm going to give you some plumbing, uh, which are basically what we do. Uh, in our lab. And so what we do in our lab is that we trap individual atoms. And so we trap individual atoms in what are called uh, tweezers. So a tweezer is just an optical dipole trap tightly focused. So for those of you who don't really know that, I'll just briefly remind you what is an optical dipole trap. So you've got two ways to look at this, a very classical argument and a quantum argument. The classical argument is the following. Just shine a laser, which is essentially an oscillating electric field, onto an atom. You distort the electronic cloud, so basically you induce a dipole which is proportional to the driving field, and those two are going to interact with each other. There is a minus d dot e type of interaction. And now, depending on uh, alpha, you can have either a trapping or anti-trapping configuration where the intensity is the largest. 
I remind you that the polarizability of an atom, so whether you're quantum or classical, doesn't matter, around the resonance has kind of this dispersive shape. If you are in the wing, you kind of avoid the spontaneous emission. And the interaction between atom and light, therefore, is u is minus d dot e, which is minus alpha e square. Actually, you should have some factor one halves, but I'm not caring about them. So it's kind of an equivalent of a conservative potential, either repulsive or attractive. And here we're going to use them in the attractive way just by working below the resonance. So if your laser field drives the harmonic oscillator lower than the harmonic frequency, the dipole on the field are in phase, and therefore what minimizes the energy is the place where the uh, electric field is the largest, which is to say the intensity the largest. So that's just one way to look at that. You don't need quantum mechanics to do that. The second, uh, the second way to look at it is just through this idea of light shift. So basically you just shine a laser onto a two-level system, the Rabi frequency is again defined by h bar omega is d dot e, d being the dipole coupling the two states. And the effect of this light, which is off resonant, is just to shift this ground state down, uh, depending on the detuning, uh, whether it's above or below the resonance, it's either up or down. And so if it's below resonance, it's down. And uh, you can, in this way, trap atoms. The only drawback of this is that, of course, with the available uh, laser power, uh, it's not so easy to get uh, trap depths which are larger than a few millikelvin, and already it's hard, and therefore people have to wait until development of cold atoms in order to be able to trap the atoms. So how do you go from there, this dipole trapping, to uh, the tweezer? So the idea is just to take a single beam, exactly the one uh, delivered by this, uh, this laser pointer, and to focus it by a lens. Just the only thing you do is that you focus it very tightly. So in this way, by focusing this Gaussian beam onto a size which is typically W, you know that the in the propagation direction, you've got a waist, uh, sorry, a radi uh, relative distance, which is basically the square of the waist divided by the wavelength. And so you see immediately that if you manage to have the waist on the order of the wavelength of the light, it basically means that you've got W as a size in the three dimensions. So just a single laser, is able to trap in 3D. Okay, so this is this idea here. So you just need to use a lens which has a very large uh, numerical aperture in order to be able to focus the light very tightly. So in this way, you've got a trapping volume which is typically the cube of the wavelength of the laser you use. And the nice thing about that is because it's so tightly focused, just one milliwatt of laser on one micrometer is enough to create a dipole trap of one millikelvin, which is already a lot. Okay, so how do you create those kind of uh, diffraction-limited uh, lens, you know, which have large numerical aperture? I mean, there are two approaches to that, and people have developed various of them. So this is the one that we had developed at the Institute Optique. Philippe Granger did that at the end of 2000. So it was basically a homemade objective, so many, many lenses. And at the end of the day, you focus the light down to uh, 0.8 microns. So it's kind of a nice piece of engineering. It's just very hard to reproduce. And so basically now you can buy for uh, 200 euros on the Thorlab catalogs an Asphere lens that does the same job, essentially. Not quite, though. You have to be a bit careful. Uh, so basically able to focus the light, just this single uh, part number lens here, allows you to focus the light down to one micrometer. Uh, I just uh, show you here this uh, optical path because it's interesting to see that to trap the light, we use this red laser. But when we shine resonant light on the atom to make the atom fluoresce, we use the very same objective to collate the light. So basically, you're using it to trap, but also to collect the light, and it is both done very efficiently because you've got these large uh, NLNs. So th this is called a confocal microscopy that people use a lot in biology, for example. So in practice, how do you do that? So this is kind of a, like an artistic view of the setup. So you start with a light at 850 nanometers, and it impinges onto this device, which I'm going to discuss in a minute. You just focus this light into a reservoir of cold atom. So your reservoir of cold atom is nothing very special. It's just a magneto-optical trap. So none of these quantum degenerate gases, no nothing. It's just a plain laser cooling thing, so it's reasonably simple, operating at about 100 micro K. When the atoms are in this magneto-optical trap, what you see is that they scatter the light, which is the resonant light induced by the laser that do the cooling. And you can separate off the trapping light from the fluorescence light and collect it onto a CCD camera, which well, is just an expensive CCD camera, but still. Uh, and so basically, when you look as a function of time on one pixel of the CCD camera, which is supposed to uh, look at the region where the atoms are, you see this kind of step telegraphic signal. So 
once again, this is the fluorescence induced by the, the MOT light, the cooling light. If you switch off the cooling light, there is just no signal, right? But the fact that there is this cooling light allows you to see this kind of step thing. So that was uh, seen for the first time by Philippe Grangier around the 2000. And that was actually the first time that people saw individual atoms uh, trapped in, uh, in such river. So let's try to look at how the, the, the trapping work. Yep. Uh, because you don't have two <laughs> in the plateau. If you had two, you would see a double step here. OK, I'll show you a picture in a minute, okay, which hopefully will answer your question. It's in second, so it's a real time uh, on, the cam on the camera. Actually, when we operate the experiment, we, do, we go a bit faster than this. It's too slow. <laughs> uh, but it basically means every <coughs> few seconds, you can have a new atom. OK, so how does the loading work? <coughs> Sorry. So the basic idea is that you've got this uh, tweezer, which is focused inside the magneto optical trap. And basically, there is a loading rate. So the atoms goes at random into the trapping region. So there is a loading rate, which is the mode density times the square, which is kind of a cross-section of the trap, times the velocity, uh, the average velocity the atom has. So that's just the loading process. And you also have another process, which is an expelling process, which is a two-body collision that occurs in this trap. And I'm going to give you an uh, explanation of why this is so. But this is typically a two-body process, which depends on the number of pairs of atoms you have in this trap. So if you've got no pair, but you've got no losses, if you've got one, you've got this, and, and so on and so forth. V here is the trapping volume. And you see why it's so important to have a very small trap, because it means that the constant here, the rate constant, is going to be very large. What is this collision? It's just two atoms colliding with each other and being expelled by a very highly energetic collision. So what is this energetic collision? This is what is called, and that's actually, uh, no one really knows, but that's the current uh, understanding or... The, that's the tradition, the oral tradition that they were going to ask. The idea is that you just take two atoms which are in the ground state, and the pair of atoms absorbs a photon, so create a molecule, one atom being in state S, the other one in state P, the first uh, excited state. And then when they are in this state, they interact very violently by what is called a resonant dipole interaction, which is a 1 over R3 potential. And so those two atoms are going to attract each other very violently, and by the time that they accelerate and decay because they have only a very small uh, lifetime, typically 10 nanoseconds, they release a lot of kinetic energy. So typically, a kinetic energy, which is about few 10 or few uh, hundreds of millikelvin, so which is larger than the trap depth. So for you, it appears as a depth, uh, as a loss. So. Okay. And so uh, people, uh, I mean, uh, we can calculate, it's just a back on the other calculation, that the two atoms would stay together in the trap for a time which is typically 100 microseconds. So it's almost impossible to measure them because during this time, they do not scatter enough photons. You almost never see those two atom uh, events. So now, how do we understand those steps here? Well, I mean, the f rising front is just an atom entering the trap. It stays for some time. I mean, of course, uh, it's a conservative potential. So if they go in, they should go out. But you've got the cooling laser. So that's the cooling data that prevent them from coming out. And so when the fluorescence stops, it's actually because the second atom tried to enter the trap, and basically they are lost almost immediately. Okay, so now, uh, the, the fact that you've got just one atom in a regime which is called a collisional blockade, it has nothing to do with Rydberg blockade, by the way, is just a balance between this loss and the loading. So basically, if the loading is S uh, slower than the losses, you lose the atoms before uh, you can reload one atom. So that's the reason why you've got this step-wise uh, uh, thing. And the thing which is critical, once again, is the fact that V is small enough that this indeed can overcome this number. Okay. So, just to answer your question, this is how we s know that we can have uh, one and only one atom. So basically, you start with a mod which is very dense, and at some point, so you've got the fluorescent signal, which corresponds to many atoms in the tweezer, you decrease the loading of the mod, so you decrease R. And at first, some time, you enter a regime where basically you go to this kind of toggling thing where you've got many to exactly one atom in the tweezer. Okay, so in the same tweezer, you can operate in both regimes depending what's the density of the mod that you have around. Okay, all this has an obvious drawback, is that you have no idea when the atom is going to enter the trap. So it's a non-deterministic single atom source. 
But of course, it's a heralded single atom source because there is a signal that tells you atom I am here, I can start. So basically, we put a threshold and we decide that above there is one atom and below there is no atom. Okay. Which atoms have been uh, trapped in this way so far? Well, this is the collection as of basically two days. So initially, it started with rubidium and cesium. Over the last two weeks, there was strontium and ytterbium added to, uh, added to that, and there are some chromium, uh, potassium as well from last year, and erbium, which have been uh, trapped. Uh, it's not always as easy to do as uh, the description I gave for rubidium, which is kind of the simplest case, but uh, nevertheless, people have managed to do that. Okay, so now, we have one atom, it's trapped in the twither, okay, it's a non-deterministic source, but still, uh, you know that the atom is present and you can operate with it. But we want to do many body physics, so if we want to do many body physics, we need to have many atoms. So the way we do that is just by multiplying the number of tweezers. And there is a fairly easy way to multiply tweezers, is to use diffraction. So the basic idea is to use, or to imprint on the dipole trap beam, which creates the dipole trap, a phase, which varies in space. And Fourier optics tells us, actually from Fraunhofer, the same as from 1814, tells us that there is a Fourier relation between the phase that you imprint and the repartition of intensity in the focal plane of the lens. Okay? So basically, this Fourier transform here uh, can be calculated if you know what is the phase, and therefore you can know what is the phase pattern. So in principle now, if your idea is to have a given phase pattern, it should be kind of easy to get the phase, but there is a problem. This phase only, uh, this uh, modulator only modulates the phase. So can you see where is the problem here? Do I just need to Fourier inverse the intensity pattern I need here in order to get the, uh, the phase? The answer is no. And it's no, because if you fully inverse the intensity, you're going to get a complex number, which have a phase and an amplitude. But your modulator is incapable of modulating the amplitude, so you cannot do that. So you need to resort some alg to some algorithm. And uh, so people in the biology uh, doing microscopy, they've, they've all that over the years. So they know that much better than any physicist on the planet. So you just need uh, your literature, and you know all the algorithm that they have developed. So the particular algorithm that we use is called the gersberg saxon algorithm. So once again, the special light modulator that we use is just, uh, it's uh, an ensemble of liquid crystal, exactly the same as the one you have in this, uh, in this uh, beamer here, and that you can address locally. So in this way, you can change the index of refraction uh, locally of the, of the phase. So basically, ensemble of liquid crystal that are locally controlled. So in this way, you can imprint a phase, which is just the thickness of the liquid crystal times its index, basically. And so now, if you enter a phase, which is a dipole trap beam, which is flat, then what you have after is now the intensity, which is still one, but you, you have uh, basically modulated by a phase factor. And once again, in the Fourier uh, plane of the lens, you've got this Fourier transform. OK. So the algorithm, how does it work? So as I said, uh, I'm going to look at two things. The plane of the SLM, where I should have the phase, which I want to encode, and the focal plane of the lens. So you start by a phase which you assume is random, or actually completely flat. The only thing that you uh, know is the intensity that you want. So that's the, uh, not that you want, sorry, that you input, and that's just the, uh, the intensity of the laser. So this is the real incoming intensity. So what you do now, you just take the Fourier transform, you've got the intensity, which is basically the Fourier transform of this phase, a flat phase. And now what you're going to do in the algorithm, you replace this phase that you get by the one that you want. So let's assume that I want to have this triangle. And then I Fourier back the thing. So when I Fourier back, now I have, as I said, an amplitude and a phase. But the amplitude is not the one I can encode because the only thing I have is uh, the phase of the uh, Gaussian beam. So I replace this guy by just the phase of the Gaussian beam, but I keep this phase here, and I Fourier back. And you see that when I do that already, I'm getting close to the target phase. And in this way, you iterate the process more and more, always replacing what you calculate here by the target, and you end up towards uh, something which basically looks like what you want. Okay, so this is this kind of iterative algorithm that people have developed, and that allow you uh, to create those kind of uh, nice picture. So this is basically a gallery where you've got three columns, the first one is the phase you have imprinted. 
The second is the trapped intensity, which we measure where the atoms are. So we just use a camera, which is after the vacuum chamber. And this is an average fluorescence image of atoms that have been trapped in this tweezer. Okay? So, I mean, for some of the geometry, it's kind of easy to recognize the pattern, and you've got this kind of grid, so of course it gives a diffraction pattern in this one. I mean, if I give you this, and I ask you what is uh, the pattern, of course, I mean, I can't. I mean, it's just very hard to decide that indeed this is going to give you this kind of triangular type of lattice. But at the end of the day, all the information in co is contained in here. All right, so when I show you this picture, I actually lie to you because I make you believe that uh, all the traps are filled at the same time, which of course is not the case because it's a non-random, uh, non-deterministic loading. So actually what happens in real life is this. So you observe on the CCD camera the fluorescence coming from each trap region, and you see that this, they blink on and off as a function of time, uh, but never do you have uh, all the traps filled at the same time. So of course it's a big issue for these kind of platforms. Uh, you can do the histogram of the, uh, the, the, the trapping, and basically what you find, which is not too surprising, is that in average, half the traps are filled, and if you want to have all of them filled, it just goes like the nth power of this uh, probability to have only one uh, field, and basically uh, this, uh, this doesn't scale well. So people have proposed many ideas to do that, which I'm not going to detail, but really that was a hard uh, work for many groups for about 10 years, until kind of the easiest solution came up, and which was initially proposed by Dieter Mescheder in Germany around 2006, and he demonstrated it with just a few atoms, so we just repeated this with more. The basic idea is to start from this mess and sort the mess. So basically, you're going to move the atoms one by one until you create the geometry you want. Of course, you've got less atoms, but still, the pattern at the end is completely deterministic. So now, of course, you would need a way to move an atom. So how do you move an atom? Well, you just add to the static pattern that creates the trap another laser beam, which is tightly focused. And this other laser beam, you can make it move from one position to another. So the, the way we do it, we just use a AOD, so optical deflector. They go through this, and this optical deflector can change the, the angle, and basically you can move this moving head in any position in the plane. And so now, of course, it's just an animation, which I'm going to show you, but it works in this way. Starting initially from the atom being in this trap, you grab it very gently with your moving tweezer, move the tweezer by some millimeter, uh, not millimeter, micrometer, tens of micrometers, and drop it very gently at the position where uh, you want it to be. So to my amazement, I have to admit, the probability of doing that without losing and without hitting the atom is actually very large. And because it's very large, you can really envision doing it many, many times and then sorting efficiently uh, your trap. So that's what we've done. So basically, now the, the, the idea is kind of easy. You just start by, uh, starting by, if you want to have n atoms at the end, you start by two n traps. In average, n, uh, half of them are filled. So you've got n traps that are filled. Just take an initial image to know where the atoms are. And then you compute, you let the computer, uh, computing on the fly, the set of moves that you need to send to the AODs in order to move the, the tweezer. And you move the atom one by one until you uh, reach the desired configuration. And you take a final image and you assume, I mean, and you check that this is the one you wanted. OK, so this is the kind of gallery that you can get when you do that. So starting from a randomly loaded pattern, you can sort the mess. So this is before the sorting, after the sorting. And you can see that you can create patterns that start to be uh, as large as 50 or 60 atoms in this trap, but perfectly ordered now. OK, so the thing which is also, from an experiment point of view, is kind of nice. So fully loaded up to 50, now it's a bit more. Uh, super high filling fraction, so up to 98%, and also super fast duty cycle. We can do that three times per second. So it's very important when it comes to doing experiment with individual atoms because you've got a super low, um, I mean, you need to build the probability. So you need to repeat the experiments always. OK, and of course, I should point out that there are many groups that are doing that. And there was a very nice group done by uh, Michel Lukin in Harvard and also by uh, uh, Jae ja Wook Han uh, in Korea last year. So I'm not going to give you too many details of how we can extend this technique in three dimensions, because so far all the atoms are in a plane, but we can. And the basic idea is actually reasonably simple. I again show you the SLM, which now works in transmission, but it doesn't matter. There is the focusing length, and there is the Fourier plane, where you basically have the Fourier transform of the, of the phase. The idea now is that if you add to this phase here a quadratic phase profile, it exactly acts like a lens. Actually, a lens is nothing but something that adds a quadratic uh, phase on the wavefront. And in this way, you can move this focal point by a given amount, which is given by this beta, the curvature that you imprint in here. 
And so that's exactly what we use in order now to replicate the thing in three dimensions, to do the trapping in three dimensions. It's a bit more complicated. Uh, you need to use the superposition principle. It doesn't really matter. There is an, uh, an algorithm that allows you to implement this very basic idea and create uh, this structure here, which you have. So this is, again, 3D structure, fluorescence of image. It's an average fluorescence. So once again, not all the traps are filled at the same time. Here. And so basically, you can create some kind of hyperboloid, some kind of funny Möbius strip, for example. So typically 100 uh, sites. Uh, those kind of fullerene, this Eiffel Tower, which is probably useless, but uh, very nice for communication. Um, uh, yeah, and so once again, when we do this experiment, and it's a bit lengthy because you need to image plane by plane, sort plane by plane, and repeat that as many planes as you have. But at the end of the day, you can reconstruct those nice uh, structures. Of course, you can also do the sorting in 3D. It's a bit more demanding, but that's an example, basically, of uh, uh, the Bravais type of lattice. So basically, that's the elementary cell of a Bravais lattice you can uh, create. So this is a FCC uh, lattice. So you basically image plane by plane. You can also do bilayer graphene by intertwining two of these uh, hexagonal uh, things here, uh, layers, and uh, which can be as close as you want, basically. And you can also do some kind of thing that kind of excites the theories to study frustration in spin system. This is a pyrochlor. So a pyrochlor, so this is really a non-trivial uh, structure here, which you can uh, actually exactly uh, build in three dimensions with this. Thing. OK. Any questions so far? So I'm almost done, so I just want to give you a few plumbing details again, uh, because they will be necessary for tomorrow. So in the same way that Philip showed you uh, I mean some what it looks like in real uh, on the experiment, I mean, this is what it looks like in our case. Uh, so basically, everything which is important is happening in a vacuum chamber here. We have a Zeeman slower that creates a beam that fills the magneto-optical trap, right? And inside this chamber, we've got this kind of uh, about 10 centimeter type of uh, device where you've got coils to create the trap. And you also have the two lenses, the two high NL lenses that we used are basically in a confocal configuration. So parallel, focus parallel, in order to recycle the light. And kind of importantly, what we had to do, and that's very specific to the Rydberg, the Rydberg are very annoying because, of oh, very annoying, it's a nice feature as well, but they are very sensitive to any stray electric field. So you need to make sure that you compensate those uh, electric fields. I guess that for you, you have also this kind of problem uh, with the micro motion. Uh, so this is uh, also something we have to take care of. So basically what we did, so this is kind of an unzipped view, if you wish, of the same picture. So you've got the two lenses. And we add some four electrodes here in order to be able to compensate or apply any electric field in any direction. Unfortunately, a lens is a dielectric object. And so as soon as you start to apply voltage here, the first thing that the lens does is that it gets charges. Okay, so that's very bad for Rydberg. So what we do is we have to put a metallic coating onto the lens, which is transparent as much as it could, and which, to a certain extent, avoid the, uh, the patches electrode to build onto the thing. But you know, those are all these dirty details that actually you need to ca take care of if you want this platform to really work. OK, so now I need to tell you how we measure the fact that we have an exciting an atom to Rydberg state, and that's very disappointing. We measure it by looking at losses. When the atoms are in the ground state, in typically a millikelvin trap deep tweezer. Uh, they are trapped. And as soon as you put them in the Rydberg uh, state, basically what happens is that there is an anti-light shift, a blue light shift. It's called the ponderomotive force. doesn't really matter, but that's kind of intrinsic. It's all essentially a free electron. It always sees a blue shift in this case. And therefore, the Rydberg is expelled on the tropic region. So for us, the signature of the fact that we have one atom, one uh, atom, uh, one Rydberg, we have created one Rydberg, is the fact that at the end of the experiment, you've got no, uh, no atoms present any longer. But it's kind of annoying, obviously, because if you have any extra losses in your problem, and uh, you always have, uh, I mean, you don't know whether this is the physics you wanted to study, the Rydberg excitation, or, or the just the bad thing occurring. Nevertheless, the efficiency with which we can measure the uh, Rydberg is still higher than 95%. So it's still not too bad, although uh, it's probably not good enough to do large-scale uh, quantum simulation. I will show you a very uh, concrete example tomorrow. OK, so now we want to excite the atoms to the Rydberg state. So what we need to do is to uh, do a laser excitation. This is a UV transition at 297 nanometers to rubidium, so very UV. Uh, so we don't do that in a single uh, shot. We just break it into a two-photon transition. I mean, nothing original. Everyone does the same in this uh, field. I mean, only the choice of the configuration uh, depends, but it's always a two-photon transition almost. 
So you start by preparing the atoms by optical pumping in a very well-defined uh, state, and then you send your two lasers that cover the entire array, basically. And in this way, you can uh, perform, because it's a two-photon transition, so it's basically, uh, you've got an effective Rabi frequency here. So you can completely ignore the fact that you've got an intermediate state. Huh? So you basically have this state. The laser is doing that. You've got a Rabi frequency in the blue, Rabi frequency in the red, and it's an effective Rabi frequency to go from here to here, which is omega red, omega blue, over for delta, where delta is the detuning, which is here. Okay, so you can completely ignore that and just say that you have a two-level system. And indeed, you can drive a Rabi oscillation on this, uh, between those two states here, so the ground and the Rydberg state. So you see that it's kind of all right, but I mean, it's far from the nice thing that we see from the ions. There is still some dumping, and uh, we have, over the last year, really understood what is the source of all this, and we're trying to correct for this, but unfortunately, this is very expensive. It means buying uh, much better lasers. Okay, and so the second thing which uh, I'm going back to is the fact that uh, we can very easily couple those Rydberg to a microwave. So if you just take this Rydberg state, this particular one, but it doesn't really matter, it's not too far from another Rydberg state, typical transition in the gigahertz, tens of gigahertz. So now because it has this very large dipole, it's very easy to drive a microwave transition between those states, and this is indeed a microwave drive that you see over several uh, microseconds. And you see that here, contrary to the laser case, you almost have no damping, actually, just because the source is intrinsically good. Okay, so I think uh, I'm basically done uh, for today. So I've given you all uh, what we needed to really tomorrow go towards the interaction and uh, then to start the uh, many body physics part uh, of the lecture. So with this, if you have any questions. Or Questions? Leonardo? So I have two technical questions. The first one is uh, 